Dear sisters and brothers in Christ Jesus, welcome to this homily on the seventh Sunday in Ordinary Time. A story is told about a very successful but rather notorious business tycoon who was celebrating his 80th birthday. And as he was proposing what of thanks, he said, I'm extremely happy and proud to say that I have no enemies. And others asked, how did you manage it? Especially because there must be many rivals in business. And he responded, I killed them all. This is the method of the world to eliminate the enemies. But Jesus today tells us there is another easier and better way of destroying your enemies. That is by making them your friends, by loving them. Melt the enemy with the warmth of your love. Dear sisters and brothers, today's gospel passage is possibly the hardest of all teachings of Jesus. Not only to practice, but also to preach and even to listen to. As we know where we stand in our acts of loving and forgiving one another. Going the extra mile is okay. Giving without expecting a return is fine. But loving our enemies, praying for those who persecute us, hmm, that is where the difficulty comes. So today, let's reflect upon today's gospel passage, praying for the grace to love and forgive as God loves. If last Sunday's readings were about how to act as Christians, today's gospel is about how to react as Christians. For example, last Sunday we were told that it is not enough that we don't kill, but should not even insult or get angry. Today Jesus tells us how do we respond to somebody else's actions against us. For example, if somebody strikes you on the right cheek, if somebody offends you, somebody is your enemy, if somebody forces you to do something, etc. How do we respond? In short, how do we deal with people who are our adversaries in a Christian way? As we mentioned in the beginning, the best way to destroy our enemies is to make them our friends. This is the way of Christian, Jesus says. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And how are we to do it? Firstly, by not reciprocating evil with evil and not resorting to violence. It is not anymore an eye for an eye, but when someone strikes you, on the right cheek, turn the other one as well. Secondly, by not restricting doing good deeds. Jesus says, if anyone presses you into service for one mile, go with him for two miles. Give to the one who asks of you and don't turn your back on the one who wants to borrow from you. Love is to do good things at all times and for everyone. In the demands of law, there are always restrictions, limitations, and expectations. But such restrictions and limitations do not make sense in love. Love does not ask how much is enough. Its expressions are unlimited and unconditional. And that is what we have to practice. Do not restrict your good deeds. Thirdly, by showing the Christian way of doing things. The old law allowed a proportionate reaction. If the other one is good to you, be good to him. If he is bad, be bad to him. That is why it was called lex talionis, which means the same. If he strikes you once, strike him back once, etc. In short, you do to others what is done to you. 
But the Christian way is doing things as God has done for you. The other is not the criterion, but God the Father, who allows his rain and sun to shine and fall on good and bad alike. Since we know the details of these radical commandments of Jesus, today we rather focus on the common message of this, that these two these messages give us. And I would like to concentrate on two of them. Firstly, mediocrity is not a Christian virtue. We know what mediocrity is, isn't it? It means something ordinary or less than average. Jesus never allows this, but he wants us to be perfect as the Heavenly Father is perfect. Today's world considers reasonableness as mediocrity. To love your enemy, not to resist those who persecute you, and to pray for them, etc., are not reasonable, not practical for a rational man. They are demanding too much, so leave them. The same complaint we often hear about the church as well. When she tries to emphasize the gospel teachings, that they are too demanding, that she shouldn't be pushing so hard, or people will break and leave. And so, instead of demanding excellence, we are asked to settle for mediocrity. Instead of pushing up the standards with the heaven being the limit, we demand that the church lowers the bar to accommodate all, our, all and sundry. The glaring examples are of marriage and the sanctity of human life. And this mediocrity today poses as democratization, inclusiveness, tolerance, compassion, and even charity. But what this attitude does is to promise salvation without a cross, charity without needing to sacrifice. We try to make religion easier and more accessible in order to stem the steady decline in followers. But mediocrity is not what Jesus proposed and what he suggests. He did not make the mistake of letting his standards be measured relative to his cultural context. He asked his disciples, do you also want to leave? He demanded nothing less than perfection. You must therefore be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And to a secular mind, his ways are shockingly unreasonable and upholding his principles is tarnished as exclusivism, lack of charity, lack of openness, and so on. But we are asked by Jesus today that, that as Christians, our yardstick is God the Father. He is the norm of our lives. In other words, Jesus is asking us to make God the Father as our role model. But the question is, how can we be perfect as the Heavenly Father is perfect? The Greek word for perfect is teleos, which in fact means complete, mature, to achieve the maximum capacity, to be best suited for its purpose and so on. One may say a camera is perfect if it records to the best of its capacity. So we are perfect to the extent we are fulfilling the purpose of our lives, our roles. That's why someone said perfection is not in how much we have achieved, but how much we have tried. So the sincerity in our attempts to overcome the mediocrity determines our perfection. And the second message for us is to see what are the implications of the radical commandment of Jesus to love our enemies. How can we forgive and love our enemies? We are only humans after all. So many people consider it an impractical and unreasonable demand. But it is because 
they don't realize what love is in Jesus' view. It is true that we cannot have the same feelings and emotions of warmth and closeness we feel towards those close to us, to those who betrayed our trust, who tarnished our names, falsely accused us, who cheated us, and who constantly act against us. We must understand that love and forgiveness that Jesus demands from us is an act of the will, not a feeling. It is not an emotion. The word Jesus uses for love is agape and not the other Greek words for love. It indicates an act of reason. It is about the concrete choice we consciously make. In this sense, it is not so much a love coming from the heart, a feeling, but it is a decision of the will of a rational person. It is a deliberate choice to show respect and kindness, restraint and regard to all people, irrespective of their actions and irrespective of our feelings towards them. Others may think we are unreasonable, we are losers, we are condoning injustice and atrocities. But we love them, pray for them, not because who they are, but because who we are. The children of the Heavenly Father, who lets the sun shine and rain for the good and the bad alike. And since it is a conscious action, forgiveness can be practiced slow by slow, which may even start by pretending to forgive. By pretending to forgive, praying for them, and performing small acts of kindness, you will slowly forget that they are against you. This means by refusing to entertain negative thoughts about them, by praying for them, wishing them good, refusing to speak badly about this person, doing nothing that could harm him anyway. We place him in the hands of the loving Father. And perhaps our small acts of kindness will change their hearts as well. As St. Paul tells us, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans 12, 20 and 21. Remember, Jesus never said it's going to be easy, but he does show us the way. So dear sisters and brothers, the other person is not the norm of what we do or say but God the Father, and He demands nothing less than perfection. Remember, perfection is not about how much we have achieved, but how sincerely and earnestly we have tried. We pray, Lord, give us the willpower to love and to be compassionate to those who offended us and hurt us so much. May we imitate your example from the cross, and we pray that you bless all of them.